This right here is the humerus. It is the bone of the upper arm and it fits something like this. So here's the humerus and it is the bone of the upper arm. As you can see, there are two ends. There's the upper round end, it's round, and the lower flat end, which is flat. The upper round end is also called the proximal end and it forms the shoulder joint. While the lower flat end is also called the distal end and it forms the elbow joint. In the middle of the two ends, there's a long shaft. There's a long shaft as you can see right here. And that's why this bone is called a long bone. Next up, we need to determine whether this humerus belongs to the left arm or the right arm. For that, we need to follow the following procedures. First, you need to make sure that the round proximal end is directed upward and the flat distal end is directed downward. Second, you need to make sure that this large concave surface that is present right here, large concave surface, which is called the olecranon fossa, it is directed posteriorly. So it's facing backward. And third step, Here's the smooth rounded surface, which is the head of the humerus. The head of the humerus is always directed medially. That is, it is facing the midline of the body. So after following these three procedures, we can determine that this is indeed the humerus of the left arm. So what are the three steps? First, the round end should be facing upward. The flat end should be facing downward. The olecranon fossa should be facing backward and the head should be facing medially. So first we are going to look at the upper end of the humerus. The upper end of the humerus contains a smooth round surface which kind of looks like a bald head. So it's called the head of the humerus. Just below the head of the humerus, there's a line encircling the head. Just below the head, it encircles the whole thing. And it's called the anatomical neck. It separates the head of the humerus from the rest of the humerus. There's a second neck which is present somewhere around here. And it is called the surgical neck. The significance of surgical neck is that the axillary nerve passes through the surgical neck. And if the surgical neck fractures, there's a possibility that the axillary nerve may get damaged. Let's turn the bone. You can see two elevations here and here. This elevation is greater in size, so called the greater tubercle. And this elevation is lesser or smaller in size, so called the lesser tubercle. The greater tubercle starts anteriorly. However, it goes till the back of the head. This whole thing is the greater tubercle. It kind of flows to the till the back of the upper end. We know that the head of the humerus is always directed medially. So the greater tubercle is directed laterally and the lesser tubercle is directed anteriorly. In between the two tubercles, we can find a groove. And this groove right here is called the intertubercular groove. As you can see, there are two heads of the biceps muscle. Here's the biceps muscle. This which I have shown with color blue is the short head of the biceps muscle. And this which I have shown with color red is the long head of the biceps muscle. The long head of the biceps muscle passes through the intertubercular groove and that is why the intertubercular groove is also called the bicipital groove. So here's the intertubercular groove which is present between the two tubercle. It has three parts. The greater tubercle extends into the lateral lip. The lesser tubercle extends into the medial lip and in the middle there's the floor of the groove. To the lateral lip, pectoralis major muscle is attached. To the floor of the groove, 
latimus dorsi muscle is attached and to the medial lip teres major muscle is attached see the head of the humerus fits in the glenoid cavity of scapula let's say this cavity right here is the glenoid cavity and here's the he head of the humerus the head of the humerus fits in the glenoid cavity and then moves the type of joint that is formed here is a ball and socket joint where the head is the ball and the glenoid cavity is the socket the ball fits in the socket and this joint since it's present at the shoulder region is called the shoulder joint we know that the greater tubercle is present laterally that is it is facing laterally however it wraps around the upper end if you look closely you can see that the greater tubercle which is present laterally is wrapping the upper end till the posterior surface of the upper end so till the posterior surface you can see the greater tubercle and posteriorly three out of the four rotator cuff muscles are attached to greater tubercle and they are the supraspinatus muscle infraspinatus muscle and teres minor muscle so to the posterior of the greater tubercle three out of the four rotator cuff muscles are attached right here there's the supraspinatus infraspinatus and teres minor muscles to the lesser tubercle the fourth rotator cuff muscle is attached and that is the subscapularis muscle and it is important for us to train the rotator cuff muscles so that our shoulder remains healthy and strong now let's look at the lower end of humerus which is broad the lower end contains two condyles they are called condyles because they look like the knuckles of a hand this right here is a condyle which looks like a pulley and that is why it is called trochlea attached to trochlea laterally is a condyle which is smooth and round that's why it's called capitulum there are three fossa at the lower end in total there's a fossa present right above the trochlea called the coronoid fossa there's a fossa present right above the capitulum called the radial fossa this right here is the anterior view posteriorly there's a large fossa that is present which is called the olecranon fossa to the trochlea articulates the ulna and to the capitulum articulates the radius see the ulna contains a notch and this notch is called the trochlear notch and then there's a process which is called the olecranon process the olecranon process of the ulna fits inside the olecranon fossa of humerus and the trochlear notch of ulna wraps around the trochlea of humerus just like this and forms a hinge joint similarly the head the head of the radius articulates with the capitulum just above condyle there's your epicondyle this epicondyle is directed medially so called the medial epicondyle and this epicondyle is directed laterally so called the lateral epicondyle the significance of medial epicondyle is that the ulnar nerve the ulnar nerve passes through the medial epicondyle so if there's a fracture of medial epicondyle a high risk of damage to ulnar nerve exists the lateral epicondyle is less prominent as compared to medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle serves as the origin for the forearm extensor muscles the medial epicondyle is much more prominent and it serves as the attachment for the forearm flexor muscles now let's look at the shaft of the humerus the shaft of the humerus contains three borders and three surfaces the three borders are the anterior border the medial border and the lateral border between the anterior border and the lateral border is the anterior lateral surface between the anterior border and the medial border is the anterior medial surface and posteriorly 
बिटवीन द मीडियल बॉर्डर एंड द लैटरल बॉर्डर इज द पोस्टीरियर सर्फेस For the sake of easiness, I have divided the whole shaft into two halves: the lower half and the upper half. In the lower half, the three borders are as it is. There's the anterior border, medial border, and lateral border, and the surfaces are as it is. There's the anterior medial surface, anterior lateral surface, and posterior surface. However, once we enter the upper half, things start to get a little bit tricky. Here's what happens. So here's the anterior border, right? Follow the pin. It's still anterior border, anterior border, anterior border, anterior border, anterior border, anterior border, anterior border. Now you can see that the anterior border has originated from the lateral lip of the bicipital groove. So here's the bicipital group groove. This is the lateral lip of bicipital groove, and it is from the lateral lip of bicipital groove that the anterior border originates similarly what about the lateral border so here's the lateral border lateral border lateral border as we go up and up and up the lateral border kind of disappears it's difficult to find out where the lateral border exactly is what about the medial border so here's the medial border follow follow the pin so medial border medial border medial border medial border it turns out that the medial border originates from the medial lip of the bicipital groove so let me show the same thing with the help of a diagram so here's the humerus here's the anterior border here's the lateral border and here's the medial border between the anterior border and lateral border is the anterior lateral surface between the anterior border and medial border is the anterior medial surface and posteriorly between the medial border and the lateral border is the posterior surface the anterior border goes on and on and on and on to make the lateral lip of bicipital groove it's the bicipital group b i c i p i t a l to form the lateral lip of bicipital group similarly the medial border goes on and on and on and on to form the medial lip of bicipital groove while the lateral border goes on and on and on and on and it kind of disappears and it is difficult to locate the lateral border on the upper half of the humerus so these are the three borders now let's look at the three surfaces of the shaft of humerus first is the anterior lateral surface the anterior lateral surface contains a v shaped tuberosity so between the anterior border and the lateral border there's the anterior lateral surface the anterior lateral surface contains this v shaped tuberosity and it is at this tuberosity the deltoid muscles get attached and that is why it is also called the deltoid tuberosity on the anterior lateral surface of the humerus there is a v shaped tuberosity where the deltoid muscle gets attached all the three heads that is the front delt the side delt and the rear delt they get attached at this tuberosity and that is why this tuberosity is also called the deltoid tuberosity the anterior medial surface continues to form the floor of the bicipital groove so between the medial between the anterior border and the medial border there's the anterior medial surface the anterior medial surface continues and continues and continues and continues and finally forms the floor floor of the bicipital group or intertubercular group if we look at the posterior surface at the back we can see that the posterior surface at the upper region contains a groove at this particular position and this groove is called the radial groove cause the radial nerve passes through this groove and an injury or a fracture at this area can lead to an injury to your radial nerve the triceps muscle is made up of three heads a lateral head a long head and a medial head just above the radial groove right here is the origin for the lateral head of triceps and just below the radial groove right here is the origin for the medial head of triceps